Welcome to the late breaker session at the Is It Online meeting. I can already guarantee you that we have exciting research ahead, and I hope that you can really enjoy this session. As you will see, there are some exciting abstracts on COVID-19, but there's also the usual abstracts that we find on novel gene defects and novel findings that are important for the inborn errors of immunity field. I really hope you can enjoy it and that you will join us for the live Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marta Rizzi and Carsten Speckmann from Freiburg describing our findings in a patient with BOP1 deficiency. This is the history of a three and a half year old boy from consanguineous Georgian parents. He suffered from recurrent infections from one and a half years onward. He then developed additional neurological symptoms around the age of two, initially with a gait disturbance and later spastic tetraparesis with loss of ability to walk. At age three, the patient developed focal seizures. A CMRI at that time point showed enlarged outer CSF spaces and hypomyelination of the white matter, clinically and radiologically suspicious for a chronic viral infection. However, CSF studies showed moderate pleocytosis, but negative extensive microbiological investigation, including viral PCRs, and also an autoimmune and metabolic workup was negative. The patient's blood count, basic lab chemistry, and an extensive metabolic disease workup from the blood were also all without pathological findings. The patient was, however, identified to have completely undetectable IgG, AM, and lack of specific antibodies. On basic immunology, we found the patient to have normal B-cell numbers, despite his confirmed lack of serum immunoglobulins. And we found the patient to have decreased class switch memory B-cells with a relative increase of atypical memory cells expressing either IgG or IgA, and we found a reduction in circulating T follicular helper cells. Otherwise, we found no T cell abnormalities. Adding on the uh, family history, the patient has a seven year old sister who's clinically healthy, but a brother who died at 14 years of age from Cell Vega syndrome, which is a well defined systemic perioxomal disorder. As typical for Cell Vega syndrome, the brother had characteristic dysmorphic facial features, liver disease, cataract and a progressive neuropathy, which was different to the neurology seen in our patient. The brother had no susceptible to susceptibility to infections and was carrier for homozygous mutation in PAC-16, which is well known to be associated with cell Vega syndrome. Exome sequencing was carried out and confirmed that our patient indeed did not suffer from cell Vega syndrome, who only carried the family PAC-16 mutation in a heterozygous fashion, but our patient was identified to harbor a homozygous unreported frame shift mutation in a gene called POU2AF1, which encodes for a protein called BOP1, which in our patient, as shown in this immunoblot in comparison to healthy control, were absolutely missing, prompting further investigations. BOP1 Bob one is a transcriptional co-activator selectively expressed in B lymphocytes, and it confers the specificity for octamers to OCT1 and OCT2 transcription factors. The BOP1 deficient mouse has a reduced number of T cells, reduced, slightly reduced number of B cells, defect in germinal center formation, um, low IgG and IgA, and an almost normal level of IgM. What's the phenotype of BOP1 deficient B cells? T dependent like activation of patients uh, BOP1 deficient B cells with CD4 dilagan IL21 resulted, uh, actually did not result in plasma cell formation compared to control B cells. The addition of IL4 to the culture induced class switch in BOP1 deficient B cells, uh, even though to a lesser extent compared to control B cells. T independent activation with CPG, which stimulates the like receptor 9, did not result in formation of the marginal zone B cells, as well as not, did not result, it is not shown here, um, in the formation of plasma blast. 
Looking at immunoglobulin secretion in the supernatal, in none of these conditions, uh, we observed immunoglobulin secretion in the supernatal of culture in the patient's B cells, uh, supporting the inability of these B cells to, to become plasma blast. So class switch is concerned, but plasma, plasma blast formation is completely impaired. Mouse species uh, uh, deficient in BOP1 have an altered B cell phenotype. We did the, the phenotype the size of the patients and we observed a reduction in the expression of B cell receptor, IgD and IgM, a reduction in the co-receptor, CD79 alpha and beta. Sick expression was also reduced as well as the survival receptor, buff receptor and CD22. In line with this uh, uh, abnormal phenotype, B cells were also impaired in their activation in response to B cell receptor reduced P sick. You can see it here, slight reduction in PSC gamma 2 phosphorylation, as well as uh, reduced uh, um, activation in response to CD40 like and uh, reduced NF uh, phosphorylation as well as P sick. EBV cell lines uh, generated from B cells of the patient show the similar phenotype to the primary B cells, with you can see reduction in BAP receptor, in CD22, in the core receptors, as well as uh, uh, in immunoglobulin receptor not shown here. Gain of function experiment performed by overexpressing wild type form of uh, BAP1 into the EBV cell line of the patient show the partial restoration of the um, surface expression uh, of buff receptor CD22 and IgD. In summary, we described for the first time that POP1 mutation can, occur, can cause an impairment of B cell function in humans. The, uh, human, the subjects had normal B cell number while in mouse were reduced, and a complete gamma globulinemia while in mouse uh, was only uh, the uh, reduction of the class switched isotype. As for the immunological phenotype, we observed a severe intrinsic B cell defect with impaired B cell receptor signaling and defect in plasma blast development in response to T dependent stimuli. The both patients and mouse show low T follicular helper cells. The defect in class switch was then uh, um, um, unlimited, but class switch was still present uh, both in mouse and in humans. If this defect, uh, um, this defect can be cause of this increased susceptibility to the infection in patients, uh, but uh, if these are the cause of the neurological phenotype, it's still a matter of investigation. With that, I would like to thank Patrick and Julian that performed the immunological studies and Oliver for the clinical workup. Our Kiel and Georgian colleagues for the referring of the patients have been Nielsen, which is an expert on both one. And you for your attention. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Charlingo from University Hospital of Angers. And today I will uh, tell you about new uh, mutation in SSH3, which are associated with a new x link combined immunodeficiency. I don't have any disclosure to declare. So first, the SSH3 protein and its marine ortholog SLY1 are uh, highly conserved, and they both comprise with two nuclear localization sig signal on the entire domain with a phosphorylation site, which has been identified on the serine 27. And this protein also have a SH3 and a SAM domain on the C-terminal extremity. And the SLY, SLY1 protein is mainly expressed in lymphoid cells. SSH3 function in human has not been investigated yet, but some mice models have been uh, described. And interestingly, the mice which are knockout for SLY1 exhibit uh, profound uh, T cells, B cells, and even NK cells, lymphopenia. Another mutant has also been published, uh, which lack the entire domain of uh, the protein, including the nuclear localization signal. And again, in cis mice, there is a decreased cellularity in the thymus and the spleen. And this latter model has been used for um, determine determining the uh, specific function of SSH3 in the lymphocytes. And interestingly, after TCR activation, the lymphocytes of these uh, mice, these mutant mice, have a decreased proliferation, suggesting that SLY1 is involved in TCR signaling. Uh, 
some experiment has also been conducted on uh, wild type uh, lymphocytes. And I've shown that uh, the SLY1 protein relocates from the nucleus to the cytoplasm after TCR activation. But despite these mice um, data, uh, no immunodeficiency has been identified in humans yet. So we describe here seven patients from six unrelated families with variant of the SASH3 gene. In all these families, as you can see, the mother were carrying the mutation we found in their son. The first patient we identified, the patient A1, was a two years old boy uh, with a very severe varicella. And his brother was identified afterwards after we did the diagnosis on his uh, brother. The second family is also of specific interest. The problem patient was identified as adult, but he experienced a infections uh, as he was a teenager. And interestingly, he has uh, he, one of his brother who died at 17 years of age of a fatal varicella infection and did a previously infection when he was a kid. And one other brother of his problem uh, has also been diagnosed uh, as adult. Uh, with an ITP. As you can see, in this family, uh, several women on the mother side uh, also have non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But unfortunately, in this family, uh, we don't have any uh, genetic materials except for the patient and his parents. And in this family, a very early stop mutation has been um, identified on the, which probably lead to expression of a, a very truncated protein. All the other mutations were identified are located at the c tear domain of the protein. About the clinical presentation, all the patients have a recurrent and or severe infection, and specifically viral infection. Notably, the first patient we identified had a very severe varicella infection with a huge skin involvement, as you can see on the picture here. Two other patients uh, have chronic herpes simplex uh, infection, uh, sometimes requiring uh, intravenous uh, treatment. And one other patient has recurrent wards. More than half of the patient also have recurrent sinopulmonary infections. And three patients have eczema. The immunological test we did um, exhibit features that are consistent with a combined immunodeficiency. Two patients have hypogammaglobulinemia. More than half of the patients that has been as, uh, investigated have an naive CD4 T cell lymphopenia. And most importantly, when it was assessed, every time the lymphocyte proliferation in response to specific antigens such as tetanus toxoid was impaired. The lymphocyte proliferation uh, after TCR activation was uh, investigated in one patient, and it was decreased, suggesting that the TCR signaling, at least in this patient, uh, is impacted by the variant. It seems that this uh, new immunodeficiency mostly affects the adaptive uh, immune response, as the NK cell cytotoxicity and the cytokine response to TLR ligands was, were normal. Endly, we evaluated the uh, baseline protein expression in two patients with a mice missing variant. And it appears that the SASH3 protein is mostly expressed in the nucleus and without evidence of a decreased expression in these patients. But further investigations are needed to determine the pathogenicity of each variant, of this variant particularly, and all the other variants we identified. I would like to uh, acknowledge all the team of the University Hospital of Angers, specifically Alban Ziegler, uh, Coralie Malbranche, Isabelle Pellier, and Miriam Chuzo. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank Ivan Sheen from the Texas Children's Hospital, who was very helpful for gathering all this data and coordinate uh, the project with us. And obviously all the clinicians, all the physicians, and all the patients for sharing their records. Many thanks.
Hello everyone, my name is Janvi Aluri and I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Megan Cooper's lab from Washington University. Uh, I'd like to first thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. I'd also like to remind the audience that you may submit your questions via the Q&A function and they'll be addressed at the end of the session. I'm here to give a talk on mosaic and germline gain of function variants in TLR8 and how they lead to a novel primary immunodeficiency. I have nothing to disclose. I'll start with the clinical phenotype. So we have six unrelated male patients, the unifying feature being neutropenia. They also have certain other defects in the B-cell compartments, T-cell compartment. They also have lymphoproliferation and infections. Two patients were identified to be positive for anti-neutrophil antibodies. One patient was identified with the TLGL leukemic phenotype. One patient had the presence of a dominant T-cell clone, suggesting the presence of a highly activated T-cell phenotype. One patient unfortunately died at eight years of age due to infections. Three patients due to progressive bone marrow failure had to undergo bone marrow transplant, of which one patient died post-transplant due to fungal infections. And two patients are currently alive. They are on GCSF therapy and they require IVIG. Whole exome sequencing identified uh, variants in the TLR8 gene, and interestingly, five of these six patients were mosaic for the variant, meaning that not all the cells carried the variant, and the sixth patient was identified to be carrying a de novo germline variant at a unique location. I would also like to note that of these five patients who were mosaic, four patients carried the same mosaic variant, which was P432L. So what exactly is TLR8? Uh, TLR8 is an endosomal pathogen sensor. Uh, it basically is located on the X chromosome and it senses single cell RNA, especially rich in AU sequence and is abundantly expressed in the myeloid cells and particularly functions via the MYD8 pathway to activate NF-kappa-B or IRF7 to upregulate type 1 interferon signature. Uh, there are a lot of differences between human and uh, mouse TLR8. Uh, specifically, mouse TLR8 lacks these five amino acids, which are especially important in the ligand binding of the human TLR8. One of the main reasons why there are very few studies on TLR8 function available in literature. So as I stated, five patients for mosaic. So one of the first things we had to do was assess the percentage of mosaicism and we used droplet digital PCR. Uh, we not only assessed the immune cells uh, like monocytes, T cells, B cells, but we also looked at the fibroblasts because the second fundamental question to answer was what stage of embryogenesis perhaps this even must have occurred. And uh, we used a whole bed samples, as I stated, the fibroblast samples and different immune cells. We used maternal or the mother cells as negative control, which lacked the variant as indicated by this quadrant. And we saw that less than 30% of cells carried the variant, which was very interesting. And I stated, uh, we could analyze fibroblast samples from four patients, of which three, as indicated by red, uh, were carrying the variant in the fibroblast, suggesting that this mutational event was not restricted to the hematopoietic compartment. Uh, we also analyzed other immune, set, uh, immune subsets. Uh, we saw normal TLR8 expression in the patients when we compared it to healthy controls, and we wanted to assess the profiling or we wanted to assess other immune uh, abnormalities. So we looked at the T-cell compartment, and we saw that multiple patients had inverse CD4-CD ratio, a skewed 9 to memory ratio, high percentage of Tembra cells. We also looked at the B-cell population, and we saw that three patients had extremely low B-cell numbers, they had reduced overall, all patients had reduced class switch memory B cells, which was consistent with the data where they required immunoglobulins. They were hypogammaglobulin myth and they required IV IG therapy. Uh, two patients were further assessed and we saw that they had a reduced percentage of transitional B cells. We suggested that overall the B cells had a defect in transitioning from the bone marrow as well as maturation into memory B cells. The patient sera was also very interesting. We saw elevated inflammatory cytokines, including IL-18, even IL-18 binding protein was elevated, interferon gamma, soluble CD25, IL-1223, P40, and BAF, which correlated with their low memory B cells. Uh, then we assessed the patient cells uh, themselves. Uh, we looked at CD14 and looked at phospho nf kappa b as a readout, used two different doses of TL8 stimulation. And the major challenge to work with these primary cells is the mosaic environment but it was still encouraging to see that the patient cells were responding to lower dose of stimulation. There were few cells which were responding, which was completely absent in the healthy control. And that was really encouraging, but at high doses, we did not note any differences. And that was the reason we had to move to two different model systems to understand the functional effect of these variants. Uh, 
One was to make use of HEK null cell line, which was deficient for TLR8. We transiently transfected the variants indicated by the patient group, and we saw that these variants particularly had a hypersensitive, uh, they were hypersensitive to ligand stimulation, or they had a lower activation threshold in terms of the fact that they were responding to lower doses of TL8 stimulation uh, indicated by this uh, TL8506, which is a TLR8 ligand, I'm sorry. So uh, the wild type catches up at higher dose, which is 500 nanogram per ml, and the loss of function remains unresponsive even at the highest dose, suggesting that these variants lead to gain of function. Then we went back to the patient stem cells themselves. We basically got these fibroblasts, reprogrammed them to iPSCs, identified single cell cloned iPSC, which was just carrying the reference or the mutant by using DDPCR again, and differentiate them into CD34s and differentiate them further into neutrophils. When we did that, we didn't note any differences in the generation or production of neutrophils, but what was interesting was that these neutrophils that carried the variant which is P432L or F494L, were again responding to lower doses, which was completely absent from the wild-type derived neutrophils, which was again seen using CRISPR-edited CD34s. We edited these CRISPRs with these CD34s to carry P432L variant, and we saw a similar phenomena where they, we saw them responding at lower dose of ligand stimulation when we used phospho-NF-kappa B as a readout. So overall, I would like to conclude this talk by, uh, by stating that we've identified these TLR8 variants which result in a very broad clinical spectrum, and we note that TLR8 gain of function, just 10 to 20 percent of these cells was enough to cause the disease, and this dominant effect was further proved by the hyperinflammatory cytokine environment that we saw in the patient's serum. Again, I would like to note that we didn't see antineutrophil antibodies in multiple other patients, and that suggests multiple other factors which would be very interesting to assess, and we speculate it could be through serum fast ligand mediated neutrophil destruction. We saw elevated serum fast ligand. I could not show the data here. We also can speculate it could be through the myelosuppressor effect of the activated T cells, or it could be also the activated monocytes, which would be very interesting to study further. With that, I would like to thank all my lab members and also the collaborators, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hello, my, my name is Paul. I'm an MD PhD student in the Casanova lab, and today I'll talk to you about autoantibodies against type 1 interferons in patients with life threatening COVID 19. So I have nothing to disclose. And uh, we are, we've all seen these images of very severe lung uh, disease in patients infected with COVID 19, but actually the prevalence of such severe disease is low, and most infected individuals are either asymptomatic or have mild. Uh, mildly symptomatic disease. So, main question is how do we explain such inter-individual variability? And uh, we know that the type 1 interferons are a very important antiviral group of cytokines. Uh, there's actually 17 type 1 interferons, set, uh, 13 alphas, beta, and then epsilon, kappa, and omega that all bind IFNR1 and IFNR2 receptors, and then which leads to downstream signaling and antiviral response. So these interferons have been discovered in the 1950s, uh, but uh, only a few years ago were the first inborn errors of uh, type 1 interferon described, first in patients with yellow, uh, with viral vaccine disease, such as uh, following MMR or yellow fever vaccine uh, vaccination, recently uh, herpes simplex virus encephalitis, and finally, very recently, and this is the next talk, uh, patients with critical COVID-19. So autoimmune phenocopies of uh, in, of inborn errors of cytokine immunity have also been described over the last 25 years. And for example, in mycobacterial disease, uh, autoantibodies to interferon gamma uh, mimic completely patients with inborn errors of interferon gamma immunity. This is the case for IL-17 immunity or IL-6. And actually, autoantibodies to IL-17 and IL-6 were, were discovered before the corresponding inborn errors of immunity. And what's interesting is that these uh, anti-cytokines or autoantibodies are uh, frequently genetically driven. For example, air deficiency in patients with autoantibodies to L17 or a specific HLA haplotype in patients with autoantibodies to interferon gamma. So what is known about autoantibodies to type 1 interferon is actually um, goes a while back in the 1980s where some patients 
treated with interferon alpha or beta had these autoantibodies. Also, a year later, uh, the first description of patients with lupus and these autoantibodies, and from 2000 onwards, um, it was discovered that nearly all patients with autoimmune disease APS1 have autoantibodies to type 1 interferon. Nevertheless, all these are clinically silent. Um, and there's only actually a few descriptions of patients with these autoantibodies to type 1 interferon with severe viral disease, first by Ian Gresser in 1995, and then it wasn't until 2015 uh, that it was again described. And so since COVID arrived, uh, we heard of three patients with APS1 um, who suffered from critical COVID-19. So this leads to the hypothesis, could these autoantibodies to type 1 interferon underlie life-threatening COVID-19? For this, we tested a large cohort of almost a thousand patients with life-threatening COVID-19. Uh, and we tested them for autoantibodies against interferon alpha and or interferon omega. And as you can see here, we found that almost, well, actually a bit more than 10% of these had very high titers of these autoantibodies against interferon alpha and or omega. As a control group, we screened uh, over 600 asymptomatic infected individuals and found that none of these had um, high titers of uh, anti-type 1 interferon autoantibodies. And finally, we screened the control of uh, over 1,200 healthy controls finding that only a very few of these, 0.3% approximately, had autoantibodies to interferon alpha and or omega. So the next step was to show that these autoantibodies were actually neutralizing the activity of uh, these type 1 interferons. And so as you can see here, uh, patients with autoantibodies against alpha 2 and omega actually completely blocked the induction of phosphostat 1. And this induction is restored when we remove these autoantibodies. We've later shown that ISG induction was also abolished in these patients, similarly actually to patients with APS1. And we've studied two autoantibodies so far, but we also wondered uh, about the 17 type 1 interferons. So here you see that actually these uh, patients with autoantibodies to interferon alpha and or omega have, uh, these autoantibodies are able to recognize the 13 interferon alphas most of them also recognize interferon omega, and then a few of them recognize interferon beta, kappa, and epsilon. This is very consistent with the phylogenetic uh, tree that you see here, in which you see that the 13 alphas are very similar. They're very closely related to interferon omega, but they're quite different from the other three interferon type 1 interferons. And finally, we tried to see uh, in vivo if... Uh, these autoantibodies can neutralize interferon alpha. And so we looked in the blood of these critically infected uh, patients who had COVID-19 and found that uh, interferon alpha circulating levels were actually low or undetectable in all patients. Whereas on the other hand, most patients with life-threatening COVID-19 without autoantibodies had high level of circulating interferon alpha. And in, to study the effect of these autoantibodies, against the protective effect of interferon alpha-2, we infected cells um, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 and uh, treated them with interferon alpha-2. When we incubate this, uh, this uh, with plasma of healthy controls, you actually see that the interferon alpha-2 treatment completely protects these cells against SARS-CoV-2. On the other hand, when you use a commercial antibody against interferon alpha-2, you see that there is a very high viral replication, and this is exactly the same with plasma of patients with autoantibodies, showing that it also blocks the protective effect of alpha, of interferon alpha against SARS-CoV-2. What was striking is the percentage of males with autoantibodies. 94% of uh, patients with autoantibodies were males, and uh, almost half were over 65 years old. So this is in striking difference with the number of patients without autoantibodies in the asymptomatic infected group, and also higher than the patients without autoantibodies in the life-threatening group, suggesting a potential X-linked disease. So as a conclusion, we can say that at least 10% of patients with life-threatening COVID-19 have autoantibodies type 1 interferons. These autoantibodies are able to neutralize uh, type 1 interference in vitro, in vivo, and block the protective effect against SARS-CoV-2. 
And strikingly, they were mostly present in males, and half of these males were half of these individuals were older than 65 years old. So this suggests that a broad screening for these autoantibodies um, are is needed in patients with SARS-CoV-2. Also, the screening of uh, donors for convalescent plasma and many potential ther therapeutic interventions could be discussed and later tested. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, many people. Uh, the first, the physicians, the patients and their families, the members of, uh, of our lab, and the many co-authors who greatly contributed, Lindsay Chan, the Charlie Rice's team, Laurent, Jean-Laurent, Luigi, Helen, and uh, everyone who's participated greatly to this study. And also all the sequencing hubs and participating centers who've been recruiting patients worldwide within the COVID IG effort. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present our new data in inbound arrows of type 1 interferon in patients with severe COVID-19. I have nothing to disclose. So following Paul's presentation, here we are testing a, another hypothesis that is inbound errors that underlie severe influenza also underlies severe COVID-19. So here in red are the three non-monogenic causes of severe influenza that are TOL3, IRF7, and IRF9. And in blue are the other 10 genes that also in the type 1 interferon pathway, but known to cause other viral infections. To test this hypothesis, we sequenced over 600 patients with severe COVID and over 500 patients with mild diseases. First, we look for the predicted loss of function variance in all these patients. And we found that there is a significant enrichment of pre predicted loss of function variance in the severe cases compared to the mild cases. Then we tested all the variants, not only the predicted loss of function ones, but all the variants that is um, with a minor allele frequency less than one in 1,000 in these patients. We test them functionally. And this work was done by a army of postdocs and students, not only from the Casanova lab, but also from our collaborators lab. And we found totally 24 loss of function or severely hypomorphic variants in 23 patients with life-threatening COVID in eight genes among these 13 genes. These patients are of different age, gender, and ancestries. To our surprise, there are two patients with autosomal recessive IRF7 deficiency and two patients with autosomal recessive if not one deficiency. None of them had ever been hospitalized with other viral infections before COVID-19. So we really focus our study on these patients. First, we're lucky enough to get enough fresh blood from a patient with complete loss of function of IRF7 um, to purify the plasma cytoid DC from the blood samples. And we infect the PDC with e either influenza A or SARS-CoV-2 and perform RNA-seq on these cells. And we found that in control PDC, the highest elevated genes are actually type 1 and 3 interferons over tenfold change. And in the patient cells, uh, these genes are either unchanged or in some cases even downregulated. And this shows that the patient cells with autosomal recessive IRF7 deficiency fail to produce interferon ring responding to SARS infection. We also took a patient with autosomal recessive if not one deficiency and showed that the patient cells has complete loss of expression of if not one on the surface of the cells and the patient cells fail to respond to type 1 interferon, either alpha or beta. And in this experiment, we show that the patient cells with 
autosomal recessive, if not one deficiency, fail to respond to type 1 interferon. Now, we've shown that patient cells fail to either produce or respond to type 1 interferon. Are these defects actually causal to their SARS-2 infection? This experiment was done by Jeremy LePen in Charlie Rice lab. He did a very elegant experiment by transduced the patient fibroblast cells with ACE2 plus TMPRSS2 to make the cells susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And with the patient cells, he showed that the patient cells with top three def deficiency, either in autosomal recessive or in autosomal dominant, they failed to control COVID, uh, SARS-2 infection. And this defect can be rescued by pretreatment with interferon beta. In patient cells with IRF7 deficiency, cells fail to control SARS-CoV-2 infection and can be rescued by either pretreatment with interferon beta or overexpress of the Y-type IRF7. In patient cells with if not one deficiency, again, the patient cells fail to control the viral infection and it cannot be rescued with pretreatment of interferon beta, but can be rescued by overexpression of the Y type if not one. So, with this experiment, he showed that the patient cells are in fact susceptible to the SARS CoV 2 infection, and this is the cause of their um, severe COVID 19. Finally, we test the patient the plasma and show that these patients had either undetectable or very low levels of interferon, uh, type of interferon in their serum um, during infection. This feature is shared by the patients with autoantibody against type 1 interferon just presented by Paul. However, the difference is that these patients, at least the one with mutation that upstream of the interferon receptor, probably can be treated with type 1 interferon, either interferon alpha or beta. In summary, um, we've shown that there are about 3% of the patients with severe COVID-19 who carry mutations in the type 1 interferon pathways, in addition to the 10% of patients polls showed who have autoantibodies against type 1 interferon. And I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this project and the patients and their families. My name is Julika and I'm a PhD student at the KU Leuven in Belgium in the lab of Stéphanie und Baron. And I first of all want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present my work today on a novel genetic basis for PID, the inositol trisphosphate receptor subtype 3, or short ITPR3. As a quick reminder, if you have any questions during my talk, you can submit them via the button in the top right corner of your screen, and they will then be addressed in the live section after this session. I have nothing to disclose. Our work started with three patients from unrelated Belgian families. Patient one is a 12-year-old male that had a severe combined immunodeficiency requiring hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, after which he developed an EBV-induced leiomyoma. Both other patients are adults that presented with low immunoglobulins and a susceptibility to infections. By whole exome sequencing, we identified compound heterozygous variants in all of the three patients, um, with two of them here in bold being private, one of them being present in three heterozygotes in NOMAD, and two of them with an allelic frequency of about 5%. IP3 receptors are mainly located in the ER membrane and are calcium channels that allow an initial increase of cytosolic calcium after the engagement of T-cell or B-cell receptors via the binding of IP3. In a second step, this leads to the store-operated calcium entry, which then allows full activation of the cell. Together with the subtypes 1 and 2, the subtype 3 can form a complete channel, um, either as a homo or a heterotetramer. As you can see in this depiction of two opposing subunits, 
the variants that we identified are all in functionally important domains of the protein. Like here, for example, right inside of the channel domain or in or in close proximity to phosphorylation sites. The stop gain mutation of patient 3 leads to the loss of the whole transmembrane domain. As a first test of the functionality of the calcium receptors, we analyzed the calcium flux um, by using a calcium indicator dye that allows to monitor the cytosolic calcium concentrations. We always first acquired the background before adding EGTA as a calcium chelator and then the stimulus, in this case, tapsigargan and bradykinin. Tapsigargan is an inhibitor of the circa, which allows to assess passive calcium leakage from the ER and calcium ER store content. As you can see, the fibroblasts from patient one show a clearly reduced uh, response when we quantify the area under the curve as well as the amplitude of the response, indicating that this patient has a disturbed ER calcium homeostasis. To assess a more physiological response, we use bradykinin as a tPCR agonist that opens the IP3 channels via binding of the second messenger IP3. The response in patient one is again clearly reduced, indicating that IP3 mediated calcium responses are not properly induced in this patient. For both other patients, I directly investigated calcium flux in CD4 T cells using the Yonophore Yonomycin as well as Tapsic Argon. I also included the parents of patient two, which both harbor a single heterozygous mutation in ITPR3. You can clearly see that all individuals from kindred, kindred uh, two display a reduced uh, response to both yonomycin and tapsic argon, while this response is increased in patient three. This means that even individuals with a single heterozygous mutation in ITPR3 um, have a disturbed calcium homeostasis, but while in kindred two, this seems to be due to um, yeah, a defect in mobilization of intracellular calcium stores, this seems to be facilitated in patient three. To assess the implications of the disturbed calcium homeostasis on functionality of the lymphocytes, we assess T-cell proliferation after TCR stimulation. You can see that after three days of stimulation with plate-bound anti-CD3, patient two shows a reduced mean number of divisions in both CD4 and CD8 T-cells compared to the healthy donors. If we then look at suboptimal conditions with stimulation with soluble anti-CD3, this basically completely fails to induce proliferation in patient two, while all other individuals proliferate comparable to the healthy control. We obtained similar results when checking the phosphorylation of both PLC gamma and um, ERK in T cells and B cells after stimulation. Patient two shows a, a decreased response over time whereas it seems like phosphorylation of PLC gamma-1 is slightly increased in patient 3, and we even see a striking increase in phosphorylation of ERG already under basal conditions in this patient, meaning that he is hypersensitive to cell activation. We are reminded here that ERG is actually located downstream of IP3 receptor signaling, while um, PLC gamma-1 is upstream. To finally prove the pathogenicity of the variant, we use a model of hex cells that does not express any of the IP3 receptor subtypes and then introduce either the wild type or mutated forms. Um, we finished the analysis already for the private de novo mutation of patient one. And as you can see in this dose response curve um, with carbacol as a GPCR agonist, the mutation leads to a loss of function in the receptor in all of the three monoclonal cell lines um, that we invest investigated. This is also in accordance with structural predictions where the channel pore is normally neutrally charged, but if the arginine is replaced by a cysteine, this um, removes the masking of a negatively charged residue in one of the helices, leading to a negatively charged channel pore that would trap positively charged calcium ions. To conclude, we show that pathogenic variants in ITPR3 lead to PID um, due to abnormal calcium homeostasis and therefore also um, disturbed BNT cell activation. We show that there's different mechanisms of disease. And while we're still investigating this, we hypothesize that variants in patient one and patient two actually negatively, um, yeah, negatively influence channel function, which we could already prove for one of the variants. Uh, as the subtype three is the one with the lowest affinity to IP3, 
We hypothesize that this subunit acts as a negative regulator in channel activity, only allowing the opening when IP3 concentration is high enough. If you have less of this subunit, as is likely the case in patient 3, this would result in a hypersensitivity and hyperactivation of lymphocytes. For this, I want to thank my supervisors, Stephanie Unglibaron and Adrian Liston, as well as the whole lab. I also want to thank the clinicians, Isabel Mates and Rix Kreavers, and our collaborators on the calcium flux analysis, Gerd Bulting, on the triple knockout experiments, David Yule, and on the structural predictions, Irina Serisheva, and finally you for your attention. Good afternoon, my name is Otavio Del Monte and I'm a staff clinician at the National Institute of Health. Thank you for allowing me to present our data of a new inborn errors of immunity uh, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, among our cohort of patients at the NIH, we identified four unrelated males with a history of infection, both bacterial and viral infection, including warts, and severe refractory autoimmune uh, cytopenias including anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. This patient also displayed some inflammatory uh, manifestation, including granulomas, but also NRH and uh, uh, enteropathy. Two of the patients are still alive, and two of the patients, unfortunately, uh, are deceased at a relatively uh, young age. The laboratory investigation of uh, the four patients revealed uh, a moderate lymphopenia in all the patients, but what was more strikingly was the severe naive CD4 lymphopenia in four out of four patients and uh, uh, the CD8 naive lymphopenia in two out of four patients. All patients had very low B cells. However, we have to say that three out of the four patients received previously uh, rituximab due to the autoimmunity that they had. All four patients had from very low to zero NK cells and different degrees of this gamma globulinemia. We perform whole exome sequencing analysis in uh, uh, all four patients and we could find that they all shared uh, deleterious uh, mutation in the SASH3 gene. All mutation had very high CAD score and very interesting were all private mutations, so not found in public database. So the mutation were actually three nonsense, uh, two nonsense mutation, given the two patients share the, non the same nonsense mutation and one missense mutation, all at the C terminal of the protein. Uh, very uh, interestingly, um, the, the protein expression when we perform Western blot uh, showed that the patient with the nonsense mutation had no protein expression, probably due to mRNA uh, decay, while the patient with the missense mutation has had some residual protein expression. Um, I have to say that uh, SASH3 is a poorly uh, studied protein, especially in humans. Uh, we know that it is expressed in the, in the hematopoietic, stem, uh, hematopoietic system, uh, especially in lymphoid cells. Uh, there is a mouse model, actually there are two mouse models that characterize the um, SASH3 function in mouse, and it is a protein that has, please consider an adductor protein important for both TCR and BCR signals. Given the importance of SAS3 in T cells, we perform functional studies in both um, in all our patients, and we could see that T cell proliferation in both CD4 and CD8, CD8 cells uh, after stimulation with CD3 uh, and CD28 was uh, highly impaired, was partially rescued after addition of uh, exogenous IL2, but it was not improved after stimulation with PMA ionomycin. Similarly, also expression of uh, activation markers in CD4 and CD8 cells was impaired and was partially rescued by addition of IL-2. Uh, we could see these in both expression of uh, CD25, CD98, and CD71 uh, and GLUT1, confirming that there was a significant T-cell dysfunction in those patients. Dysfunctional T cells uh, may, come, may come with the uh, uh, TCR activation signaling defects. And here you see the Western blot showing the phosphorylation of several molecules critical for TCR signaling and downstream, like phosphosap 70, phospholal, phospholpialc gamma, are all impaired, demonstrating that TCR signaling is globally affected. In addition, anti-apoptotic molecules like BCL2 and BIN 
are reduced, suggesting a problem of TISA survival upon TISA. I wanted to check. And what we could see is that staining with an Xin5 DAPI uh, after stimulation uh, with C328 and also PMA uh, ionomycin both uh, showed the increased apoptosis of peripheral in peripheral T cells. So what uh, is important to remember that when there is an increase of apoptosis, so a defect in T cell survival, uh, if this happens at the time of site level, we are going to have uh, the generation of a restricted repertoire, especially a restricted TCR alpha repertoire. The hallmark of this skewed repertoire is the decreased usage of the most distal V alpha and the J alpha gene and the TCR locus, because if a time cell doesn't survive enough, uh, the, those most distal uh, gene segment cannot be uh, rearranged by the VDJ recombination machinery. And we have two ways to assess this uh, event. And one is the flow cytometry assay, uh, they measure the spread on surface of T cells of the alpha 7.2. And here you can see how actually in our SAS3 patient, the alpha 7.2 was markedly reduced in the patient as compared to the control. And then we have a more sophisticated way that is the usage of high throughput sequencing uh, of the TCR alpha uh, repertoire that shows also how the most distal V alpha and J alpha gene that are here, you can see, are in the pink areas of the heat maps, are uh, significantly underused as compared to uh, our control. Diversity was also uh, reduced. Finally, to formally prove that there is a problem in thymocyte survival, but also in selection process of the thymocyte, we use an in vitro model of T cell development starting from CD4 34 positive CD3 negative progenitors. And we saw that we can see uh, with this, this system, basically, that is called artificial thermic organized system, uh, all the stages of differentiation of the thymocyte. What we saw in our patient in P2, uh, that uh, uh, while all the different stages of the differentiation differentiation of the thymocyte were preserved, actually a very small uh, small number, so a lower frequency of uh, mature T cells were able uh, to achieve full maturation. So here you can see only 4.8% uh, of, of mature T cells in the patient as compared to the control. And moreover, we could see that the number of live cells throughout all the stages of differentiation in our in vitro system of uh, T cell maturation uh, were uh, impaired because in the patient, the number of live cells was much decreased as compared to the control. This was in association with increased number of hypodiploid cells that um, basically suggested there is increased apoptosis that was confirmed by staining with an Xin5 and DAPI. In conclusion, we have identified a novel x link combined immune deficiency due to SAS3 gene mutation. Patient may survive up to adulthood and probably hematopoietic stem cell transplant is curative. SAS3 deficiency perturbs the T cell survival and proliferation, and patient manifests also B and NK cell lymphopenia. However, the precise role of SAS3 in T cell signaling, but also in B and NK cell development, remains to be elucidated. Thank you so much for your attention. I want to thank you, my mentor, Dr. Luigi Notarangelo, Dr. Jenna Bergerson, that collaborated with me this project, and all the people that provided their clinical and bench expertise to the full characterization of this uh, very interesting four patients. Thank you also to the family of the patient. Hello everyone, my name is Matthijs. I'm a PhD student at the Laboratory of Adaptive Immunology at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. I would like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for allowing me to present our work here at ESET 2020. And I would also like to remind all viewers that there is a question button in the top right corner of your screen where you can submit your questions for this presentation, which will then be addressed in the live Q&A after this session. All right, with the formalities out of the way, I would like to start my presentation entitled Severe Congen Congenital Neutropenia with Syndromic Features in a Patient with Homozygous Hypomorphic DBF Formation. I have nothing to disclose. 
So the patient is currently a 19-year-old male born to consanguineous parents of Turkish descent who actually presented already during his first year of life with recurrent infections, and the most notable ones are listed here. Its clinical immunophenotype consists of GCSF-responsive severe congenital neutropenia with a typical promyelocyte maturation arrest in the bone marrow and also persistent hypergammaglobulinemia. Syndromic features include extrauterine growth retardation, mild facial dysmorphism, and mild neurocognitive delay. So what we did is we performed family whole exome sequencing of the patient, both healthy parents and a healthy sibling, and identified a homozygous mutation in the DBF4 gene, resulting in a lysine to arsparagine change at residue location 209. And as you can see here, both in the kindred and in the Sanger confirmation, both parents and the healthy sibling are indeed heterozygous for this variant, while the patient is the only one in the family who is homozygous. Protein alignment of multiple DBF4 orthologs revealed that lysine residue 209 is conserved across species. And when we looked for this mutation in GNOMAD, we actually found that it was extremely rare as it's only reported once in heterozygous form. And in silico tools predict this mutation to be damaging with a CAT score of 25.8 and a DBF4 specific mutation significance cutoff of 3.13. So what does DBF4 actually do? Uh, DBF4 is actually essential in DNA synthesis because it's a regulatory subunit of the CDC7 kinase and together they form the DBF4 dependent kinase or DDK as also depicted here in this uh, diagram. So the DDK together with the S phase cycle independent kinase on the G1 to S phase transition in the cell cycle actually control the phosphorylation dependent recruitment of other firing factors which are all these proteins here on the right to the pre-replicate pre-replicative complex in order to form a complete replisome, which then unwinds the DNA and initiates, and initiates DNA synthesis. And if you can look at the protein structure of DBF4 here, you can actually see that the CDC7 activation and binding domain starts at residue 214, while our mutation is located on residue 209. So the one of the first things we did was to look for a cellular phenotype in the cells of the patient. So we started by stimulating PBMCs with anti-CD3, anti-CD28, and IL-2. And we depicted cell cycle phases uh, using stainings for KI67 and 7AD as a DNA content dye. And what you can see here in these representative dot plots is that at 1.5 days of stimulation, there's no big differences between the healthy control and the patient, but after three and a half days of stimulation, the vast majority of cells of the healthy control are either in G1, S, or G2 phase, while the cells from the patient are still in G0. Likewise, when we serum starve, uh, control fibroblasts and patient fibroblasts for three consecutive days and subsequently release them into 20% FBS containing medium and then stay them for PI to distinguish cell cycle phase, you can actually appreciate here that after 24 hours of, the re of release from the starvation, that the patient's fibroblasts are significant and higher percentage of the patient's fibroblasts are in the, still in the G0 or G1 peak and a significantly lower percentage is in the G2 peak, also indicating that there is a G0, G1 cell cycling arrest in the fibroblasts. Next, we wanted to quantify the CDC7 binding capacity of the mutant allele, and we did this by co-immunoprecipitation assays in HEC 293 T cells overexpressing flag tag DBF4. So when we overexpress the flag tag alleles in HEC cells and we pull down for the flag, we can actually quantify the amount of CDC7 attached to them. And as you can see here in these two bands, there is more CDC7 attached to the wild type DBF4 than to the mutant. And if you quantify this difference over multiple repeats, you can actually see that the mutant DBF4 allele has approximately 40 to 45 percent of the CDC7 binding capacity compared to the wild type. So next, we repeated the, stimulate, the PBMC uh, stimulation experiments, but instead of doing flow cytometry, we did Western blood analysis to get some more molecular insight. And where we were we specific, specifically interested in was the uh, DDK-specific phosphorylation of MCM2. So what we did is we again stimulated PBMCs for three and five days. We took two healthy controls in the patient. And despite normal total amounts of MCM2 and normal amounts of DBF4, there is a, a, a a very striking decrease in the DDK-specific phosphorylation of MCM2, both after three and five days in the patient. And this decrease is associated with a decreased expression of cyclin-dependent kinase in inhibitor P27, with an accumulation of cyclin-dependent kinase in inhibitor P21. In the fibroblast, something else is happening, because if we lyse normal exponentially growing fibroblasts, as in the first three lanes here, you can actually see that there is no loss of MCM2, uh, uh, phospho-MCM2, but this is probably because there is overexpression of the total MCM2 protein. Then if we subsequently starve these cells and lyse them immediately, you can still see that this 
upregulation of total MCM2 is still happening and there is no loss of DDK-specific phospho MCM2. Then if we release the cells into the cell cycle and lyse them 24 hours after the release, you can actually see that this compensatory upregulation of the MCM2 is gone and this results in a very slight decrease in the DDK-specific uh, phosphorylation of MCM2 without any accumulation of cycle-independent kinase inhibitors. Of course, the main clinical phenotype of the patient is still severe congenital neutropenia. So what we did is we isolated peripheral blood CD34 cells and differentiated them to granulocytes in vitro. And we read out by, both by flow cytometry and by HIMSA. If we start with the flow cytometry data, you can actually appreciate here in the top line graph that the patient at all time points has an increased percentage of promyelocytes in its wells, and here below a decreased percentage of myelocytes. And this actually nicely recapitulates the promyelocyte accumulation we also see in the bone marrow in vivo. If we then look for mature granulocytes by GIMSA stain, you can actually see that both healthy controls have up to a, about 30% of mature granulocytes in their wells after 16 days of in vitro culture, compared to only 10% in the patient. And this granulocyte differentiation defect is actually associated with a fourfold increase in P21 gene expression. And last but not least, we performed single-cell RNA sequencing of whole bone marrow of the patient and compared it to an age and gender match healthy control. And we, isolate, we identified 13 clusters in total, with two of them of specific interest to us. Here in blue is the mixed myeloid uh, cluster, and here in red is the mixed progenitor cluster. And if we look at the differentially expressed gene list of these uh, clusters, you can actually see that in the mixed myeloid cluster, there's upregulation of several P53 targets, strikingly, again, P21 popping up here. And in the mixed progenitor panel, uh, cluster that's actually upregulation of the PERC pathway of the UPR. And this is actually also interesting because UPR has been implicated as a pathophysiological mechanism in other causes of severe congenital neutropenia. We see specific upregulation in our patient of ATF4 and DDIT3, which is actually the gene encoding job. So the preliminary conclusions for this project are that the DBF4 mutant allele is normally expressed, but hypomorphic in its ability to bind CDC7. DDK deficiency results in G0, G1 arrest in PBMCs and fibroblasts, and the CD34 to granulocyte differentiation defect in vitro. Molecular consequences seem to be different among cell types, with P21 accumulation in the tested hematopoietic cells and compensatory MCM2 upregulation in non-hematopoietic cells, leading us to conclude that DDK deficiency causes severe congenital neutropenia with syndromic features. I would like to thank all members of the Adaptive Immunology Lab, but especially my promoter and co-promoter, uh, Professor Adrian Lissen and Stephanie Humbler-Baron. I would also like to especially thank John Barber and Erika van Nieuwenhoven, former colleagues of mine, who were already working on this project before I joined the lab and from whom I learned an awful lot. And I would also like to thank Professor Isabel Meitz, who is the treating physician of this patient and also contributed to this project. And I would also like to thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, my name is Ray Young. I am a postdoc in Jean Ron Casanova Lab at the Rockefeller University. Today, I'm going to talk about um, our recent discovery of the first human T bed deficiency. So, uh, for my disclosure, I don't have any competing interest to disclose. The focus of my study is Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease, a rare disorder with a prevalence around 1 in 50,000. Uh, which is characterized by a selective vulnerability to poorly virulent mycobacterial species like BCG vaccine or non-tuberculous uh, mycobacterium or NTM. So the disease often runs in families. And uh, however, its counterparts, tuberculosis or, or TB, is very sporadic and it's very common and is caused by a more virulent strain, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is about one about a thousand times more virulent, virulent by, by, uh, than BCG vaccine. And I would like to stress here that understanding the genetic basis of MSMD will really help us understand the mechanisms of antimicrobacterial immunity, including anti-TB immunity, which may have huge therapeutic implications for TB, a disease that has been one of the leading causes of death throughout human history. So for the past, 20, um, about 25 years, studies from our lab and other labs together have identified 16 disease-causing genes, the mutations of which uh, cause MSMD. They share a high degree of allelic heterogeneity and genetic heterogeneity, however, um, a very uh, high level of physiological homogeneity, as all the genes you can see here cluster around interferon gamma. 
the mutations, they either cause an impaired production of interferon gamma, like the ones over here, or uh, a defective cellular responses to interferon gamma, like gamma receptor 1, receptor 2, JAK1, STAB1, and the CYBB. And um, however, still, half of our in-house cohort do not have a genetic etiology yet. And quite in interestingly, recently we identified a patient, P, um, with uh, M7D, who carries a homozygous variant in TBX21 gene. Um, and this patient is from a Moroccan consanguineous family. Both of his parents are heterozygous for the variant, and his healthy brother is wild type, wild type for the variant. So TBX21 encodes the protein TBAD. And uh, the, this indel variant is actually interesting. It's a six nucleotide indel. It's actually a six nucleotide swap. And this indel variant led to the substitution of a glutamate 156 and methionine 157 with, uh, within the DNA binding domain with serine and the leucine residue. And these two residues are, were, were actually pretty conserved across different species. So uh, TBAT is a well-regarded transcription factor as it governs the lineage commitment of T helper 1 CD4 T cells, which is known to be a, a, a high C interferon gamma producer cell type. Therefore, we hypothesize that uh, the variant of TBX21 may be causal for the patient's MSMD phenotype. And to test that, we first overexpressed well type or the mutant uh, TBX21 gene uh, cDNA in HEC293 T cells together with a TBAT dependent luciferase reporter plasmid. It turns out that the overexpression of the mutant uh, allele led to abolished transcriptional activity along with the two negative controls that we tested in the same experiment. And uh, when the CD4 T cells from the patients or the healthy donors were expended uh, under a TH0 or a TH1 condition, uh, the production of interferon gamma was almost abolished in the patients or greatly impaired in the patients' CD4 T cells, however, rescued by a wild-type TBAD complementation. Along with other assays that I don't have time to show here today, we proved that the patients had uh, autosomal recessive uh, complete TBAD deficiency. And we further studied the in vivo development of the patient's lymphocyte subset. Um, the CD56 bright and the CD56 uh, DIN NK cells were both uh, diminished. The frequency of uh, innate like adaptive immune cells like Evarian NK T cells or uh, MATE or B delta 2 and the B delta 2 gamma delta T cells were all diminished uh, in our TBAT de deficient patient. And the adaptive TH1 CD4 T cells as expected were, um, were basically abolished. And interestingly, um, TH1 star uh, CD4 T cells, which is a cell type first characterized by Dr. Federica Salusto's group, uh, which is predominantly um, sort of the predominant mycobacterium responsive CD4 T cells in human, were somehow preserved in the human TBAD deficiency. And in addition, we found out that the remainders of these NK, INKT made beta 2 and the CD4 T cells in our patient also had an impaired interferon gamma production. Uh, in response to non-mycobacterial stimulation like PMA and ionomycin. And we also investigated the role of TBAD in in vitro mycobacterium infection. We infected CD4 T cells from the patients or controls uh, with live BCG at MOI1 in the presence or absence of exogenous IL-12 or IL-23. The production of interferon gamma, as you can see here uh, in the culture, uh, were, uh, were greatly impaired. And it turns out that the defect uh, were mostly observed uh, in NK, uh, INKT, uh, and B delta 2 gamma delta T cells, but not uh, the mycobacterium specific CD4 or CD8 T cells. Therefore, we con concluded here that inherited human TBAT deficiency underlies MSMD by impairing the development or the interferon gamma production from innate immune cells like NK uh, and uh, the innate like adaptive immune cell types like um, INKT, MADE, or B delta 2 gamma delta T cells. However, the purely adaptive immune cells like CD4 or CDA and CDA T cells, uh, it seems that they were not 
uh, really affected by human T bad deficiency in terms of their antimicrobacterial uh, immunity. With all this, I would like to wrap up here and thank everyone who participated in this project, in particular, Dr. James DeSanto from INSERM, Lori Guncher from Harvard, uh, Boston, Philip, Dr. Philip Gross from uh, McGill University and McGill, uh, at uh, Montreal, uh, Stuart Tengi from uh, the Govern um, Institute of Medical Research in Australia and Federico Salusto from uh, Switzerland, and my supervisors, uh, um, Hacinta Bastamente from uh, INSERM and Jean-Ron Casanova uh, at Rockefeller. And I would like to thank the patient and, and, and his family and also the physician, in particular, Dr. Uh, uh, Bensain and uh, Dr. Uh, Itarabi, without whom this project would not be possible. And these are the funding sources. Thank you. Thank you all for your very inspiring presentations and for your beautiful data. We have many questions from the audience. I would like to start uh, by giving the floor to Despina to ask some questions on the first presentations. So thank you. So these questions will uh, be uh, to Marta. There was Adnan Khan who wants, uh, besides saying that it was a great talk and I agree, he wants to know, was there any effect on antigen specific T cell recall or ability to process antigen? Um, the, the T cell function was normal, we did proliferation was normal, also T cell number were normal, we had only a defect in T follicular cell numbers which can be intrinsic to BAB1 function in upregulating BCL6, which we know it's important for TFH development, but also due to the defect in B cells, which can be secondary. But uh, we didn't have any specific T-cell response defect. And there were some other questions. Um, two persons, um, Fiona and uh, Denise, uh, are thinking about neurological findings. So do you have a BOP1 related explanation for neurological findings? Are we assuming all infectious complications? And this is also the question of Denise. I would end it to Karsten. Yes, maybe I can answer this. So clinically and radiologically, it's very highly suspicious to what we see in other a gamma globulinemic situations. So we did suspect a chronic viral um, infection. So we didn't pick up a uh, virus by CSF investigations. Unfortunately, the family declined a brain biopsy, which we think is very important in this condition because you can fail to detect virus from, from CSF. Um, Unfortunately, also, the family is currently um, uh, not uh, here at our center, but far away um, in Eastern Europe and cannot travel to our center. So this is something we really need to follow up. So overall, we cannot totally exclude about one intrinsic uh, neurological component. But overall, we rather think it's infectious related because it resembles so much the situation that we see in uh, Bruton's disease in this patient, but that will need further follow-up. So thank you. In the interest of time, unfortunately, we need already to go to the second talk of uh, Charlene. So there was a question for you from Joost Frankel. Does the carrier mother has QTX activation? If so, in which cell populations? Hi, uh, thank you for this question. So actually, we didn't uh, explore the um, X activation uh, in carrier mother, and we have only few uh, mothers that are available because some patients were lost of follow up and other died. Uh, but that's a good point, and we we will probably do that too. Thank you. And another question with regard to uh, SASH3 from uh, Khan, uh, who wants to know uh, if the TCR signaling data is available, is it impaired? And uh, would that be a quick test to assess pathogenicity of the variants? So we did uh, uh, TCR um, T cell proliferation after TCR activation in one patient, with, which was uh, impaired and it's ongoing for two other patients. But as Otavia showed in her at a very great talk, uh, in their patient, they, they showed that uh, the TCR signaling was uh, overall uh, impacted by the stop mutation they identified. And so um, another question from Kimberly Gilmore 
For the such three patients, would this be detected by newborn screening with Trex? So we didn't do a track in our patient, but we did a recent immigrant by flow in three of them uh, with the CD45 uh, uh, array and CD31 uh, uh, staining. And uh, in all six patients, it was decreased. So probably track could be useful too. And the very, very last short question from Louis Dupré. Is there any evidence for autoimmunity in your cohort? Uh, in our cohort, specifically not, but uh, the, most of the patients are children. And pro, uh, we can, there, there is some autoimmunity in the uh, very big family from Ecuador, e Ecuador but unfortunately, uh, this family is living in a very remote area, so we cannot have access to other genetic testing for, for this family. Okay, thank you. I hand over to Isabel. Thank you, Dispina, and thank you um, for these questions. Um, the next qu set of questions is actually uh, pertaining to the Tolike Receptor 8 presentation on the population genetics of the variants that you have been studying and also on the most uh, prevalent Tol8 uh, variant, that is a start loss. Um, have you tested that? That is a question from Rui Yang. Uh, so, yes, I'm aware of the start loss rate, which is very common associated with susceptibility to, I guess, TB. Uh, we did look for the variants and we, we didn't see any other variant in our patients. Okay, and another question is um, actually whether you have an explanation for the pathophysiology of the neutropenia and the B cell defect in these patients. Yeah, that's something that we are actually trying to pursue and understand the mechanism behind it. Uh, so one data that I didn't happen to show was these patients did have a hyperinflammatory environment in the bone marrow too. And we think that could be one of the reasons for this uh, suppression of the B cell development that we are seeing. Uh, and with respect to neutropenia, we again think there can be multifactorial reasons. Uh, we didn't see anti-neutrophil antibodies in all the patients, but that could be one reason. One could also be the presence of this activated T cells, which are also known to have myelosuppressive, myelosuppressive effects. And we also saw uh, high levels of serum fast ligand, which is also known to be um, involved in neutrophil apoptosis. So we're still actively pursuing and understanding the exact mechanism, but just looks too varied right now to comment on what could be the possible one. And do you have, um, so was there um, actually a resolution of the neutropenia after stem cell transplantation? Uh, so uh, it wasn't immediate, but then yes, uh, two patients, they, they did have a uh, the neutropenia resolved, uh, but then I think uh, for the other patients who are on GCSF before transplant, it was like a refractory neutropenia and they were just not responding to GCSF therapy. Okay, thank you very much. The next set of questions is for, um, for Paul Waster. Um, there's many questions, Paul, um, by several um, attendees on whether these autoantibodies were pre-existing, yes or no? And if so, if pre-existing, why didn't these patients develop a severe viral infection earlier in life? Yeah, thank you. That's a very important and good question. So several arguments argue in favor of these autoantibodies being pre-existing. Uh, what I didn't have time to show is that for two of the 100 patients, um, we, have, we obtained plasma from before COVID infection and both were positive at high type and neutralizing, similar to post-COVID. Uh, also, uh, all samples were collected very early in the stage of the infection, so it's highly unlikely, actually, that um, these patients have a high IgG titers because all of these are IgGs of uh, autoantibodies developing in the, over the course of one to two weeks. Also, what I didn't show here because of time is that the six women had incontinentia pigmenti, which is an X-linked disease. Um, and we screened the cohort of 30 women with IP. And within these 30, 25% uh, of them have autoantibodies, so which suggests that it's also pre-existing. And finally, these, uh, I mean, there are several other arguments, but these autoantibodies neutralize really high amounts of type 1 interferons. And so it's suggestive that they were, uh, they had developed long before, uh, sorry, two in the not newly formed autoantibodies. 
Okay, thank you. Another question is on the biology of these autoantibodies. Did you have a chance to look already at the cells of these patients or at the molecular mechanisms of development of these autoantibodies? Yeah, that's a uh, that's the big next step. Uh, unfortunately, this it was in the midst of COVID pandemic. We have almost no cells from these patients, and what I didn't say is that at least forty percent of these patients died uh, during COVID. So we were having a very hard time to get samples from the ones that have autoantibodies, but it's ongoing. Okay, and any therapeutic insights there? It's also a recurring question. Yeah, and this is actually a question also for the APS1 patients, I think. So there's several therapeutic um, points that we could make. First, uh, ideally, we would love to remove these autoantibodies. Plasma pheresis would be a great option. Uh, I, and of course, you would want to do this as early as possible. Uh, you, you could imagine some specific uh, treatments targeting the B cells producing these autoantibodies, but it's still research. And another option is um, treating these patients with interferon beta quite early on in the disease, uh, because only 2% of those with autoantibodies had autoantibodies to interferon beta. So it could be a possible therapeutic um, um, treatment to explore. Okay, and a final question is more clinical. How would you treat APS1 patients in terms of guarding and protection during the pandemic? Or how, how early in life are these autoantibodies present in these patients? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. And we had it with the physicians taking care of uh, several of these APS1 patients. Uh, we didn't uh, give them any um, preventive treatments, but we, they wear FFP2 masks all the time, not only themselves, but also their families. Uh, and although I don't know exactly the age of appearance of these autoantibodies, I think all APS1 children and adults should be tested. And if they have them, be extra cautious. And if ever they get infected uh, with uh, COVID, obviously go straight to the hospital and discuss the different treatments we discussed about a few minutes ago. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, Question for Chen. Um, can you uh, elaborate on the IRF7 uh, phenotype and also on the role of type 3 interference in your data? Um, so for the patient, we have the PDC isolated and uh, uh, infected with both into, uh, SARS-2 and the influenza A viruses. The controls made uh, the three interferon lambda, one, two, three, uh, more than tenfold change, uh, and the patients essentially made no. So these patients do not make uh, lambda interferon, all three, all three of them, uh, in responding to viral infections. And do you have any insights also here on why these patients are doing so well? Uh, most of them are adults, and they are now becoming ill only with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and not before with influenza, etc.? Yeah, so this is a big surprise to us. You can imagine the day we find the first um, autosomal recessive IR7 patients and the in, uh, if not one deficient patients. And this is uh, what we want to study in the future, but uh, um, apparently they could be incomplete penetrance to influenza infection or to a live vaccine to MMR and to herpes simplex encephalitis, because you can have infections, um, the, all these three infections in these patients, in other patients. So apparently there is incomplete penetrance. And why is that they are more susceptible to uh, SARS-2? It's possible that SARS-2 is a, um, with, with a like high virus. Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, but also because these patients don't are not exposed to similar ant, uh, antigens in the past, uh, so they don't have any protection from antibodies, um, and these are the the reasons we can speculate. Okay, thank you very much. So, Despina, if you want to continue, um, so I have some questions for uh, Julika. Um, so there is. Um, um, need to find them again. Sorry. Um, so, sorry. Let's, um, so there are so many questions that it's um, sometimes a bit um, tricky to find them again. 
And so there is uh, the question from uh, um, Cecilia Poli, who wants to know, um, what do you think is the mechanism for neutropenia? Did you check for apoptosis marker? Uh, I think that might be a question actually from Mates, because he was the one talking about the neutropenia. Because in our patients, we didn't see it, that. It's ITP or 3, this, yeah. this book. Excuse oh. me? <laughs> it's on ITP or 3. So uh, sorry, I, I, I mixed the um, speakers up. So <laughs> No problem. So one of the questions, Yulika, is that um, why is the phenotype different? If, I mean, the first patient from the other two patients, that was one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there's still a lot of... Uh, yeah, things we have to find out, but ITPR3 is a very big protein that has a lot of um, yeah interactors also. So it is very likely that the position of the mutation is going to have a huge impact on the function. And because the mutation of the first patient is located right in the channel domain, and we could actually show that that really leads to a complete loss of function of the receptor. The other two mutations are more like close to phosphorylation sites, so really regulation of receptor activity. And that, yeah, um, for us is uh, the most likely the reason to explain the differences in the phenotype. But here's a real question for Julika from uh, Mata Ritzi. She wants to know what was the B-cell phenotype of the patients, low B-cell numbers, what about marginal zone and switched memory, and do you have information on bone marrow B-cell development? Mm -hmm. So there's also differences in the patient. So the patient one who had the most severe uh, phenotype, obviously with the stem cell transplantation, he basically had a T minus B minus NK positive uh, phenotype. Um, but the other two patients, the B cell compartments were mostly normal. Just the patient three had reduced numbers of switched memory B cells. Um, we do not have any information, unfortunately, on the bone marrow development of, of B cells. Thank you. And so I'm going to Jahani. So if I sorry if I pronounce um, badly the the, the, the name. Um, so there were questions for the um, TLA eight uh, findings. So the question was from uh, Rui Yang um, regarding the findings. The most prevalent variant, about thirty percent, is the start loss variant. Have you? Yeah, I already asked this question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So now we go to actually to Otavia with her other such three presentation. Okay, so um, sorry. So um, there are some questions about um, the from Iniam Shim uh, van der Löft regarding survival defect of such three deficient T cells. How do reductions in BCL2 fit with defects in TCR signaling? What survival signal do uh, propose such three? signaling to be involved with? And did you see a defect in naive T-cell survival? So we think it is probably uh, IL-2 driven. So BCL-2 is used by IL-2. And uh, we don't know actually if uh, uh, the IL-2 production is decreased or if a problem in signaling through IL-2. Uh, what we see is that when we add exogenous IL-2, though, we do not see a complete rescue of the phenotype. So it could be definitely also like a signaling issue. Uh, we did not assess survival just in naive C4 cells. Um, we, we didn't sort the cells and, and look at just those. Thank you. And there are two people, um, Thomas Kalina and uh, again, uh, Cecilia Poli, who are interested in RTE um, cells. Did you assess RTE by flow? Was yes, there we did and were, and were decreased in uh, three out of the four patients. All the patients with the non cells mutation had decreased RTE. Um, we, we, because our patients are adults, we couldn't go back to look at Gutri cards for newborn screening and see if uh, the tracks were decreased. We don't have that, that possibility given the age of our patient, uh, but maybe Coraline could, you know. And the last question for you um, for the time issue is from Nacho Gonzalez, who says, great talk. And he asked, did you have the opportunity to look at unconventional T-cells? No, we did not look at unconventional T cells. Uh, there was another question regarding instead the hypodiploid uh, uh, cells. And I just want to say that we have very um, 
new data, sidesick data on three out of our four patients, included a missing patient. And it seems that there are like problem in mythotic spindle. And so this is why, uh, this is why we think it could be, you know, uh, the reason of the increased uh, number of hypodipole cells. Uh, we also performed X inactivation in two out of the four mothers and the nonsense mutation mother was, was actually um, fully skewed to the wild type uh, X chromosome, while the missense uh, uh, mutation mother uh, was not skewed, was was partially skewed in the myeloid cell compartment, but not in the lymphoid compartment. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we need to go on. Isabel, do you want to continue? Or I asked the question on... Um... For Matthias, I think you can ask the questions. Okay, so Matthias, uh, there were questions from... Um, Khan Butsuk, who wants to um, know more about the um, way why predominantly the neutrophils are affected. Uh, given the physiological rule of CDC7, would you not expect rather or at least also a lymphocyte effect? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And it's actually a question that we have also asked ourselves a lot. Why are certain cell types affected more than other cell types? Because, of course, the DDK has important uh, function in all cell types that uh, synthesize DNA. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer for sure. But what I can tell is that there are a lot of mutations and other proteins already known in the DNA synthesis pathway, which cause very comparable phenotypes. For example, we have Gins-1 deficiency, who also presents with severe congenital neutropenia. But on the other hand, we have... Uh, MCM4 deficiency, which then presents with uh, mainly NK cell deficiency. Uh, so there is yeah, various phenotypes within mutations in the same pathway. And I think this is, needs to be very well studied why these differences occur. And I unfortunately don't have a permanent answer for that. It's a very short question because we are running out of time. Um, from Joost Treckel, where there are other myelolid lineages affected, for instance, blood, red, uh, red blood cells. If not, what's the explanation? Um, so, clinically, we know that the patient, of course, has severe congenital neutropenia and he's on GCSF treatment. But what we also see is that there is a monocytosis, which, of course, we see often. Um, in the red blood cell department, um, in the first seven years of life, the patient was anemic for long periods of time, for sure. So, there's definitely also something going on there. But now, as the patient grows older, we see that his, his hemoglobin levels are uh, in the lower limit of no around the lower limit of normal, so to say. So, uh, yeah, for sure, there's also something going on there. Okay, thank you. Isabel, you want to um, go to the next speaker? or? Okay. So, um, to Rui, there's a question on um, how can you explain actually the, um, the, the findings that we know or what we know about Tibet um, and how you, how you can reconcile this with the data you, you found here as a yeah, very restrictive phenotype, actually. That's uh, exactly, I think, a huge surprise to us. And that's, I think, what makes our study interesting. I think that also probably applies to many other important uh, protein and genes that's already well studied in mice as um, sort of the non-redundant role of those protein um, and the genes are still need to be elucidated, I guess, through our study of, you know, primary immune deficiency and human genetics. So, and also a question by Miko, which I can't retrieve, but I think I know by heart is that um, Miko Sepinen asks you, so are you, you, um, you are making a distinction between the interferon gamma production by different sets of um, adaptive versus so-called innate cells and the importance of interferon gamma production? Can you comment on that? And, and yeah, also again on what we know about the role of interferon gamma? Uh, it's also sort of a little, I guess, a little surprising to us that it seems that adaptive T cells, um, alpha, beta, CD4, and CD8 T cells. Um, for for these adaptive T cells, the interferon gamma production seems largely redundant for antimicrobacterial immunity. However, the interferon gamma production from innate-like adaptive T cells, like um, mate, uh, beta 2 and, uh, mm -hmm. and IFK T cells, and NK cells, and including uh, innate. Uh, purely innate cells, NK cells, they were more uh, non-redundant for antimicrobacterial immunity. It's very interesting. Okay, very interesting data. 
Um, with this, I think we have to close the session already, unfortunately. Um, I want to thank you all for your participation and for showing your um, mostly unpublished data. Uh, congratulations. Um, thank you for participating and good luck further on with, uh, with your work. Um, Despina, I don't know if you want to add something. Sorry, I feel it was a really exciting session and it's uh, always a bit unusual to do this uh, virtual, but you did a great job in doing your presentations. Um, we need to find um, ways to, to continue to discuss in these COVID times and uh, hopefully we can do it live next time at the next AZ Congress. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.